This story will blow your mind. He drowned, met Jesus, and learned something huge about love. You have to hear this. Saints remembered 30 years later. Saturday, April 25, 2015. 1,323 hours. My father announced one summer day, while on vacation, that he was going fishing in the Brazos River. I begged to accompany him so that I could play in the water while he fished. I had four neighbors who I asked if they could accompany us. We all piled into Dad's car and drove to the river. When we arrived at the river, we moved 30 or 40 yards away from Dad's fishing spot and ran into the water. After about an hour of playing in the water, my father announced that he was going upstream and asked us to accompany him. As he walked along the bank, we began wadding upstream. Only one of the five boys, a friend of mine, and I didn't know how to swim. I was about 10 yards behind everyone else as we wadded upstream. I stepped into a hole and fell through. It happened so fast that I didn't have time to take a breath before collapsing. I began fighting my way to the surface and swallowing water. When I broke through the surface, I started spitting out water but didn't get a breath of air before going back under. I struggled to the surface and began spitting water but I went back under before getting a breath of air. This struggle was repeated several times and I was running out of air. I was also becoming exhausted from the struggle. As I struggled in the water, I became enraged at myself for failing to take the necessary breaths of air during the brief periods when I was above water. Finally, I became so exhausted that I stopped struggling and gave up. Everything went into slow motion right away, and my movement seemed agonizingly slow, just like we see on TV or in movies. I became aware that my arms and legs were moving at an agonizingly slow pace to the point of being ineffective. I was aware of rising up out of my body at this point. I looked at my struggling body and was unconcerned about being in two places at the same time. Actually, I wasn't in two places at the same time. My body was down there and I was up here. I was watching my body struggle in the water, but I couldn't feel any struggle or water on me from where I was. I then began to rise further, and when I reached about 10 feet above the water, I came to a halt and hovered there. I was amazed to be above the water, and I was also relieved that I wasn't in pain from struggling and swallowing too much water, nor was I exhausted from the previous struggle below. I became aware of a sphere of light about 20 feet away as I pondered my situation. It was suspended at my eye level and was extremely bright. It was roughly the size of a basketball, and the light seemed to swirl around within its confines, similar to smoke swirling in air, yet it emitted extremely bright rays of light. I noticed a small pure black speck in the center of the light. I was intensely focused on that speck for some reason. As I stared at it, it moved toward me and grew larger until it was the same size as me, and Jesus emerged from it and stood before me. I immediately raised my hands, as if to shield myself from him, and told him to leave me alone. He was a pure holy being, and I was undeserving of his presence. I was a mere mortal, tainted by the sinful nature of this physical world. When he extended his hand towards me, any feeling of guilt or unworthiness vanished. He stood majestically in front of me. He had a rich golden complexion and radiated golden light in all directions. Light travels at slightly more than 186,000 miles per second, and we cannot see its speed with our physical eyes. But I could see his glorious light emanating from him in all its majestic glory. My command of the English language could not do justice to the lovely radiance he exuded. Not only could I see this light, but it also seemed to give me spiritual energy. The light radiated outward in all direction, carrying Jesus' love, wisdom, and grace, and it seemed to penetrate my soul. When I looked down at my body, it was as white as freshly fallen snow. He stood before me with his long hair and beard, dressed in the clothes we see in paintings and drawings of him, clothes that he wore during his time in the earth 2,000 years ago. He spoke to me, though I don't recall the exact words. Fear not, he effectively said. Be at ease. His voice was medium loud and very melodious. 
I've been deaf since I was a baby and have always struggled with hearing and speech. I struggle to get to class and pass my classes. Because of my poor hearing, I struggle to connect with teachers and classmates and I barely pass my exams and advance to the next grade level. But when Jesus spoke to me, I heard him very clearly and succinctly. To my ears, his voice was very melodious and sounded like music. He didn't move his lips when he spoke to me. My lips did not move when I spoke to him. It's as if we communicated via extrasensory perception or ESP. Another strange experience occurred when I attempted to speak with him. He heard me before I could even speak to him, as soon as I thought of what I wanted to say. It was as if he could read my mind. This was how we communicated throughout the day. At this point, a massive screen appeared in front of us. This screen was so large that it reminded me of the old drive-in feeder screens that are no longer available. Because he and I were so close to the screen, it was quite large. Many scenes were being played out on this screen, which were experiences from my brief life here on Earth. There were so many scenes playing on the screen that it felt as if my entire life had been recorded there. The scenes were presented in a random order, with no two consecutive scenes being related in any way. Many people have said that when we die, our entire lives flash before our eyes. This is exactly what was happening to me. When Jesus called my attention to a scene, it zoomed out until it almost filled the screen. But I was aware of some other scenes that were still active around the edges of the scene that was now the focus of our conversation. He asked me questions about what had happened as we watched the main scene that was playing in front of us. He inquired as to why I had lied to my mother. He inquired as to why I had pulled my sister's hair. He inquired as to why I threw rocks at my dog. He inquired as to why I had yanked my neighbor's cat's tail. We watched a lot of scenes in which I lied to someone. I saw many scenes, including scenes in which I was bullying someone, scenes in which I was at fault for insulting someone, and scenes in which I had torn someone's clothes just for fun. Every time we went over a scene, he reminded me that I had done something seriously wrong or that I had done something exceptionally good. As we talked about each scene, I had to respond to him and explain why I acted the way I did at the time. I was aware that I had done something very wrong in explaining my actions in all of the scenes. And when I tried to put a little spin in my answer to lessen the seriousness of my actions, he immediately stopped and corrected me. He lavished praise on me in scenes where I had done something admirable. Jesus had a wonderful sense of humor. He laughed heartily and happily whenever something funny happened. In total, the number of scenes in which I did something right was significantly lower than the number of scenes in which I did something wrong. I had a feeling I was in big trouble with him. In fact, I was becoming increasingly concerned that I would be condemned to hell. Suddenly, the screen vanished and he took my hand in his and we began gravitating at a breakneck speed through a tunnel. This tunnel's walls, ceiling, and floor appeared to be actively churning, similar to how smoke churns in the air above an open fire, but denser. When traveling at high speeds down a road, trees, power line poles, and anything else that is stationary along the road appeared to flash by in a blur as you passed them. There was no haziness in this tunnel. It was as if the walls, ceiling, and floor were actually moving at high speeds with me but I had no idea the tunnel itself was moving. I can't describe the walls, ceiling, or floor other than to say the word permanent from Genesis, which is the best description. As I took in these observations about the tunnel, I realized how quickly time was passing. When I looked ahead, I noticed a light far ahead of me. Aha, I thought. We're finally getting there. But all of a sudden, I wasn't there. One of my friends swam under me and brushed my foot with his hand as he reached for me. I was back in my body in the water at that moment. I was fighting for air once more, desperately trying to reach the water's surface. My friend swam under me, up between my legs, lifted me to the surface and began swimming towards shore. It was the sweetest tasting air I'd ever breathed as I gasped for breaths. As he swam a short distance with me on his back, I noticed that he was also struggling. I realized that if I kept weighing him down, I would drown him.
So I slid one leg over him and slid off into the water. He came up gasping for air as soon as my feet touched the river bottom. We both struggled to the shore before collapsing on the bank. I started vomiting up the river water I had swallowed during the struggle. I'd swallowed so much water that my stomach was stretched to the breaking point, causing me to vomit repeatedly. I must have vomited water 15 times or more before starting to dry heave another 10 or 15 times. I was in excruciating pain all over my body. My muscles were dog tired from the struggle, as was my stomach from the stretching caused by the excess water and the prolonged vomiting and heaving. I was sore for two weeks after that. My father decided we'd had enough for the day and drove us all home. I never remembered the scenes with Jesus or traveling through the tunnel as I reflected on the experience over the next few days and weeks. My entire life had flashed before my eyes, was all I could remember. About 30 years later, I was reading about someone who had a near-death experience in a newspaper article and some of the scenes he described seemed to jog up my memory. After some thought, I realized that I'd been in such shock at the time that I had developed post-traumatic stress disorder and was unable to recall the events. It didn't come back to me until I searched my mind for weeks and months.